Within the call of Jesus, there is an expectation for us to produce. Jesus wants us to do more than sit back and kind of watch everything go by. He wants us to be doing something for Him. It's much like gardening, if we think about it. Uh, If you've ever gardened, you know the amount of work and time and effort it takes to do a garden well. The soil must be right. It must be tilled up and ready for you to plant the seeds. Uh, You must go out there on a regular basis and weed so that the right plants get the nutrients from the ground and not the wrong stuff. Uh, When it's about ready to go, you, you prune back some of the weaker parts of the plants so that the stronger branches produce more, and then at the right time, you gather the fruit that comes from it. It's a lot of hard work, and and in my experience, it never really works out because I don't put enough, enough time into it. And in the kingdom of God, it is much the same way. We are expected to do something, and it's difficult, and sometimes we're not entirely sure where to begin. In the book of Mark, in chapter 8, uh, we see a couple of stories from the life of Jesus that I think helps us to understand what we are to do uh, in producing for the kingdom of God. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to open up to Mark chapter 8 today. Uh, we're going to be reading uh, these 10 verses to begin with, uh, and then we'll be moving on from there. So let's read these verses together. It says this, uh, During those days, another large crowd gathered. And since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and he said, I have compassion for these people. They've already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will collapse on the way because some of them have come a long distance. His disciples answered, but where in this remote place can anyone get enough bread to feed them? And Jesus asked them, how many loaves do you have? And they replied, seven. And he told the crowd to sit down on the ground, and when he had taken the seven loaves and given thanks, he broke them, and he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people, and they did so. They had a few small fish as well, and he gave thanks to them also and told the disciples to distribute them. And the people ate, and they were satisfied. And afterwards, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. About 4,000 were present, and after he had sent them away, he got in the boat with his disciples, and he went to the region of Dalmunutha. Uh, There are two, uh, there are are four things within this passage that I see that shows how Jesus helps us when we're producing for the kingdom of heaven. The first is this, Jesus shows the meaning of compassion. Compassion. There are two major feedings that Jesus does in his lifetime. Uh, The first one in the book of Mark we read about in chapter 6. There, there's 5,000 people. It's the more famous of the large feedings that Jesus did. Uh, In that story, in Mark chapter 6, we see that Jesus and his disciples had just gotten done from a very successful ministry portion of their lives. And so they are in this place where they're excited, they've just done a lot of work, and Jesus says, hey, let's go across the Sea of Galilee to the other side of the lake so that we can get some rests and relaxation. So he gets in a boat and travels across with his disciples, but as he is traveling, a large crowd of Jews follow them all the way around, and to this place where Jesus is about to land, there's now 5,000 plus. And in that story, we're told that Jesus has compassion. And the reason he's told he has compassion in that story is because these people are like sheep without a shepherd. They were there, and they didn't really know why they were there, but they were there seeking guidance. Jesus, in his compassion, forgot about the rest and relaxation that he needed and instead went to work. Uh, This story is a little bit different. Jesus, again, has compassion, but the reason for his compassion is because of the physical need that these people had. They'd been with Jesus for three days, listening to him preach and teach and heal. And as they have done this, as they have listened, they've exhausted their food supply. And now it's time for Jesus to leave 
but he knows that some of these people have been here for a long time with no food, and they're going to be traveling a long ways home, and they will not make it. And so he has compassion. What is compassion? I, throughout this story, this is going to be one of the key elements of it. And if we want to understand what Jesus' ministry is about, we have to understand this word, compassion. Interestingly, in all of the New Testament, this particular form of this word only appears in the Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And another interesting thing is it only appears in connection with two different people. One is Jesus, and the other one appears in three different parables. So let's look at those parables just very briefly here. Uh, the first one is found in Matthew chapter 18. And there Jesus is telling a story about a king who has decided to settle the debts that he has with his servants. He's lended out money, and now he wants his money back. And this is a pretty typical thing in that time period. So as the king is sitting there, calling in his servants, getting his money back from them, one of the servants comes who owes 10,000 talents of gold. Or to put it, put it simpler, 20 years worth of wages. A lot of money. And the king asks, can I please have that money back? And the servant, he has no way to reproduce this money for the king. And when you couldn't pay back your debts in that time period, you didn't declare bankruptcy. Instead, they got their money one way or the other. And so the king ordered that his wife and his children to be sold into slavery to help recoup some of the costs. And for the rest, this man would work the rest of his life as a slave himself until every penny was paid back. Well, when this sentence comes out, Jesus says that the servant falls to the feet of the king and he begs and he pleads, give me more time. And in verse 27, we're told that the king has pity on the man. It's the same word, has compassion for this man and he forgives the man everything. The second parable we see this word pop up is in Luke chapter 10. It's a slightly more famous parable. Jesus is asked, who is my neighbor that I am supposed to love? And so Jesus tells a story about a man traveling from Jericho to Jerusalem on one of the most dangerous roads in all of Judea. And this man happened to be traveling alone and happened to be beset upon by bandits. And the bandits beat him up stole what he had, even the clothes off his back, and left him on the side of the road for dead. Well, it happened that a priest walked along this same road and saw the man who was lying there as if dead on the other side and decides that he is going to pass him without stopping to help. A Levite comes after the priest, and he does the exact same thing. And if you were to tell this story for the Jews listening to it, this would have been a shock to them. These two guys, they were the ones that, of all people, should have helped. Finally comes a Samaritan. And Samaritans were the enemies of the Jews. Jews would have characterized them as vile, evil men. The Samaritan, when he sees this Jew on the side of the road, goes and helps. And we're told in verse 33 that the Samaritan has pity on this near dead man. And that compassion compels him to not only take the man, but to see to his welfare and pay for whatever costs to see him made well. Uh, the third parable that we see this word pop up again is in Luke chapter 15. And there we're told about a son who comes to his dad and says, Dad, give me my inheritance early. And the son takes his inheritance and he goes off to a distant land and he squanders his money on loose living. 
And it happened that a famine strikes as soon as he was out of money. And famines, uh, among other things, often cause an economy of a country to come to a standstill. And so this man is in a foreign land without food, without uh, the ability to even have a job. And he ends up working in one of the worst type of jobs a Jew could ever have. And as he's sitting there, thinking about his life and his life choices, he remembers his dad who has servants that even in a time of famine are well fed. And he decides, I'm going to go back. And he doesn't aspire to be a son again. He inspires to be just a slave. And so as he is coming to his dad, we're told in verse 20, that his father sees him from a distance and he has compassion upon him. And he runs to him. And as his son repeats the words that he has already thought through, Dad, I don't want to be your son. I'm not worthy to be your son. His father cuts him off and says, No, you are my son. In all three of these parables, there are about one person, and that's God. God is the king, God is the Samaritan, and God is the Father. And this word for compassion is used for only Jesus and for God in all of the New Testament. Because it's an attribute that only he has. Paul says that we should strive to have compassion like them. He uses a different form of the word. But it's something as Christians we should try to imitate in God. So what does that mean? Well, a lot of it means that we look beyond ourselves and we look to the needs that other people have. The king was not worried about his money the moment he had pity on the servant, and instead he said, you are forgiven. The Samaritan wasn't worried about his safety or the troubles that the Jews had caused him in his life. He was worried about this man who needed to be saved. The father wasn't worried about what his son had done to hurt him. Instead, he was worried about his son being well. And Jesus, he isn't worried about the three days that he spent, and he's not worried about what these people are going to do afterwards. What he's worried about most is them being fed. And having compassion means that we look beyond our own needs to the needs of other people. But it's not just enough to have a feeling inside us and say, man, I really care about that person. In the story with the parables and in the story that Jesus does here, he goes beyond just having compassion for them and to acting for them. And so he calls in his disciples and he says, what can we do? I want to feed these people. And the disciples' reaction is to deflect to say, who could possibly do that? There's not enough places, not enough food in this area to do it. And they shift the blame and shift the focus to someone else. And too often, this is us. Too often for us, it's so much easier to simply listen to somebody and say, you know what, I'm going to pray for you. And to do nothing else. And we may go home and we may pray for them or we may not. It's part of who we are as humans. It's hard for us. It's why compassion is only used for God and Jesus because they do it naturally and we have to work on it. A man tells a story about a time he went to speak at a church in a distant town and as he was traveling to the town he came to a place in the road near a bridge where the road had fallen into disrepair. And so as he's speaking, he's thinking about this road, and he gets done with his, his speech, and he's talking to the attendees there, and, and one of the attendees brought up this road. 
And the attendee said, yeah, on my way into town, I noticed a car was broken down there. And the speaker asked him, well, did you help him? And the attendee said, no, I, I was trying to get here in time. Too often we're too worried about what's right in front of us to worry about the needs of others. But the challenge of compassion, of godly compassion, is not just to feel and care for the needs of other people, but to act to relieve those needs. And there's beauty in this story. Because within this story, we see that Jesus provides for our shortcomings. He comes to the disciples and as they're deflecting away, there's no way we're going to be able to do this. Jesus says, well, what about you? Let's stop worrying about what other people are going to do to relieve this need. Let's worry about ourselves. What do you have? And it's not much. I mean, seven loaves of bread for 4,000 people. Again, these loaves of bread were not very big. It may have been a meal for the twelve and Jesus. So it's not a lot that they have, but Jesus isn't asking really how much do you have. He's asking, are you willing to give it up? See, we fall into the trap the disciples have fell in. You know, we look at everything that's across the board and we think to ourselves, there's no way I have the resources or the ability to meet every single need that's out there. And that is true. We don't have the resources. And we don't have the ability to meet every need. And that's why I don't think Jesus is asking us, are we willing to meet every need that comes across our door? What he's asking, are you willing to help some of those needs? I mean, we can look at the life of Jesus and we can see that. Jesus doesn't help everyone that he comes in contact with. I mean, just imagine how different everything would play out if Jesus just walked around Judea healing everyone that he came across and even the Pharisees and and said, you will believe, and he just moved on. How different would his story play out? Mark chapter 6, we read that Jesus goes to his hometown of Nazareth. And while he's there, everyone is kind of Not really happy that he's there. They're they're kind of weirded out by him, in fact. We're told that he doesn't do much miracles there. So he didn't help out his hometown. Another story is Jesus by a pool in Jerusalem, the pool of Salome. and, and, And they're there, and everyone around the pool is there because they have some kind of sickness or injury that they're hoping that the pool's water would heal them from. And while Jesus is watching this event, he doesn't heal everyone. He had the power. He had the ability. Instead, he heals just one. So I don't think Jesus is commanding us to help everyone. But what he's asking is, are we willing to help some? Are we willing to give up our stuff, our bread? To help out a few. Now Jesus, he's going to provide for the things that we fall short in. And though we may not have a whole lot to give, what if we are willing to give it, Jesus will make it do extraordinary things. And this is a mentality shift that we have to have. If we're talking about compassion and acting upon that compassion, we need to look beyond, can I do it, and ask, am I willing to do it? We live in a world where stuff matters more than we care to admit. Are we willing to give up our stuff? Because if we are, God will work in wondrous ways to make what little we have into enough. There's an organization that practices this. They go by the name of Compassion International. And what they do is they go to these countries that are very poor, uh, and they go and they help out the kids that are of the poorest. And for $38 a month, 
They will go into that country and they will provide an education. And, and we forget about this. Most of the world, the education system is far worse than even ours. And we complain about our system every once in a while, but the reality is, is everyone gets to go. In a lot of countries, if you don't have money, you don't have an education. So Compassion partners with the local churches and provides an education, provides basic health care needs, provides enough uh, supplement food so that the kids are not malnourished. All in the name of Jesus. To give them a future. For $38. That, that's, a, that's a soda fountain at the local grocery store, or at the local uh, gas station. Are you willing to give up your coffee, your soda, one a day? It's just a little. But it can do extraordinary things. It's just a little bit of bread, and yet it feeds 4,000 people. Jesus provides for our shortcomings and he can take what little we have and make it do fantastic things for him. He not only provides for the shortcomings in the disciples, he provides for the shortcoming in the 4,000. They are hungry, they didn't bring enough food. Jesus is going to provide so that they can get home, but he also provides for them spiritually here. You'll notice that he prays twice. He gives thanks twice, once after, before the bread and once before he passes out the fish. And that was abnormal for a Jew. Jews just thanked before the bread. The bread was the staple of their diet. It was a part of every meal. And when they gave thanks to God before the bread, it was thanking God for the providence that he gave them of their daily need. But to pray before the fish, most likely is because of who is there, who is in this crowd. See, Jesus is in this region called the Decapolis. It's a region that was not Jewish. It was mainly Gentile. So there's 4,000 people. Yes, there were probably some Jewish people, but most of them probably weren't. And they weren't used to praying to God. And they weren't used to thanking Him for what He had given them. And so Jesus prays twice so they can understand why this is important. He provides not just for their physical needs, but for their spiritual needs as well. In all honesty, more often than not, we fall short because we're human. Because we sin and we mess up. And even in the midst of our mistakes, God provides for our shortcomings. And if we will give what little we have, we will find that Jesus is calling us onto mission. Jesus wants to give us a mission to fulfill, to complete. Jesus here calls the disciples together and notice it's not Jesus that goes about passing out the food to the people. It's his disciples. He says, you guys go. And they are, in, a, in, a, in, in all purposes, an extension of Jesus. And we understand this, right? Our current business model of our country is about extensions. Every part of the company is an extension of the company. You have your CEOs who are part of the company and what they say matter, and then you have the people under them and under them and all the way down. And if one person in that company messes up, who gets the blame? The company. On uh, December 17, 2017, there was a uh, problem at the Atlanta International Airports. They lost power. And Atlanta's International Airport is one of the major hubs of travel in the United States. So there was tens of thousands of people stuck in this airport, not, a, not sure what was going to happen, where they were going to go, when their flights were going to get out. But another problem, because there was no electricity, was that all the food services in the airports couldn't do anything. This was a Sunday. And so there's a lot of other businesses that were closed that day, but there's one business, Chick-fil-A, who's always closed on Sunday, that called all their employees at a local res restaurant there in town and said, let's make as much sandwiches as possible. And they made a lot of sandwiches, and they brought it to the airport along with a couple of other businesses, and they handed out sandwiches to all these stranded uh, visitors for free. 
the manager, the employees, they did this, but who got the praise? The company, Chick-fil-A. January 9th of this year in Baltimore, there was a hospital that decided to discharge one of their uh, patients. And she was an elderly lady, and unlike when you normally get discharged, where they kind of sign papers and they wait for your ride to get there and they help you out to the door, this, co- this hospital decided to just kind of take her to the curb and set her there in nothing but a hospital robe. And they dumped her possessions next to her in the curb. And they left her. Luckily, there was a guy there to kind of film everything and to help this lady out in near freezing temperatures and to call 911 and to get her back into the hospital. A couple employees did it, but who got the blame? The hospital. We are an extension of Jesus as his church. And everything that we do reflects upon the church and reflects upon Jesus, so we must be careful. Not to please men, but in pleasing God. And these disciples, they go out because they have a mission to feed these people, and they do it well. And Jesus and God are glorified because of what they do. Jesus also has a mission for the 4,000. Notice that at the end of the story, he doesn't just leave them. Instead, he sends them back. And we have to kind of ask a question here. Why are these 4,000 people even here to begin with? And Jesus is in the middle of nowhere, in a Galilee region. And most people didn't like Jews, so the likelihood of 4,000 Galileans Gentile people coming to listen to Jesus, it seems kind of strange until we read Mark chapter 5, where we're told that Jesus traveled to the same region, and in that region there was a man possessed by many demons who was tormenting a local town. And Jesus heals this man, but in doing so, the local people are afraid of Jesus, and they ask Jesus, please leave. And Jesus leaves, and as he's leaving, the man who he had just healed says, Can I go with you? And Jesus says, no, you go back and you tell the people what happened to you. Months have passed, and Jesus now is returning, and instead of being turned away, here we have 4,000 people who listened to the story of this man who completed his mission. And 4,000 more people are now being sent out into a region that normally would not have accepted a Jewish priest, a Jewish rabbi. And they are hearing the message of Jesus. Are we willing to be on mission with Him? Because if we're willing to be on mission with Him, there will be glory given to God because of what we do, and there will be lives that are impacted And God will use you in extraordinary ways. The last thing as a result of this story is this. Jesus will overcome misunderstandings of him. Uh, Verse 11 of this chapter, we're told that the Pharisees, Jesus has just gotten done with the feeding of the 4,000, comes back across the lake, the Sea of Galilee, and the Pharisees are there waiting for them, and they began to question Jesus, to test him. They ask him for a sign from heaven. And he sighed deeply and said, Why does this generation ask for a sign? Truly I tell you, no sign will be given to it. And he left them. See, the Pharisees weren't entirely excited about what Jesus was doing. The last time we met the Pharisees, they thought he was a demon, and they were telling people, he's from the demons. So when Jesus comes back, they say, give us a sign. In the New Testament, there are three words for miracles. They all have different understandings. One is power, and it reflects on the power needed to cause something to happen. So when Jesus heals people, that is a powerful event. Only by the power that Jesus has does that happen. The second one is wonder. 
And this is the feeling of all that is left in the people. When Jesus does something, they're wondering at it. How can this be? And the third is sign. And this is something where God shows His people that this person is from me. And interestingly, in the entire book of Mark, Jesus never once does a sign. See, the signs were what the Jews used to prove that somebody came from God. And if somebody did a sign but then convinced the people to turn away from God, the punishment in Deuteronomy was death. And so these Pharisees, they're already convinced that Jesus is not from God. And so they want him to do a sign so that they can kill him. This misunderstanding about who he is leads Jesus to say, you're not getting a sign. Many times when Jesus sends us on mission, we want to know every single detail of everything that's going to happen, but that's not how God works. He says, go. I'll be with you. And then he leaves it up to us to do it. The second misunderstanding comes later uh, when they're in a boat with his disciples in verse 16. Uh, We're told that they're discussing with one another. Uh, He's worried, Jesus is worried about us having no bread. And then Jesus, aware of the discussion, asks them, Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are you hearts hardened? Do Do you have eyes but fail to see? Your ears but fail to hear? Don't you remember? Don't you remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000? How many pieces did you pick up? And they said 12 basketfuls. He says, when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many did you pick up? And they answered seven. Sometimes we misunderstand what Jesus is trying to do in our lives, and we get to the disciples where we just completely miss what's going on, and Jesus overcomes that misunderstanding by reminding us what he's done in the past. He reminds his disciples, you're worried about food, but I've already fed 5,000, I've fed 4,000, don't you think I can feed 13 of us? And sometimes it takes a two-by-four across the head for us to realize that God is going to take care of us. Jesus wants us to have compassion on people. And He wants to overcome our shortcomings. And He wants us to be on mission for Him, and even when we misunderstand, He wants to overcome those misunderstandings. But it all begins with this. Awareness for others catalyzes God's mission in our lives. This entire chapter begins with Jesus not being worried about himself, but having compassion on other people. And if we want to fulfill God's mission, if we want to truly answer the call that Jesus is giving us in our lives, it begins by us looking past ourself and looking to the needs of others and being aware of that there are needs there. And it's not to ignore the fact that we have needs. We have problems. And I don't want to diminish those. But when we begin to look past our own problems to the problems that other people have, we'll realize that our problems really, God's going to take care of those. Are we willing to be on mission for God? And are we willing to look and be aware of the needs that other people have. Because when we do that, that is what Jesus is calling us to do. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, help us to be aware of people around us. Help us to recognize there are so many 
needs out there. And while we cannot fulfill them all and while we don't have the resources or the abilities to do that, help us just to realize that you are calling us to help some. And that in helping some, we're giving up of ourselves, of having compassion and acting upon it, that is how you are glorified in this world. Help us to glorify you in this. In your name, Son's name we pray. Amen.